But I'm glad you're here as we're starting a new series called Follow. We're starting a new series called Follow. And with everything that we preach and everything that I do here, when it comes to uh, what we do, I, I, I don't want you guys just sitting and listening to Dave as he stands up here and talks and shares and preaches. I'm, I'm hoping, and my prayer always is, as you hear God's word, is, as we hear and we participate in what's going on, and that it, it encourages you, it challenges you, it stretches you maybe to think about your life and your walk with God, maybe in ways that you never have before. And I'm praying that especially with this series called Follow that's by Andy Stanley uh, that we're going to be uh, going through here. And as many of you know in that, uh, I was raised in the Catholic Church, and we never, we never missed church. I mean, you know, if we were on vacation, didn't matter where we were, didn't matter what was going on, we went to church and stuff like that. If my mom was sick, dad took us. If dad was sick, mom took us. If mom and dad were sick, they called another good Catholic family, and they took the kids to church. You know, we never missed. If somebody said, hey, I remember, you know, they'd ask my mom and dad, hey, can you be a part of part Well, no, not during that time. There's church, or, or I can't after church gets done. So I was always raised going to church, and, and if you under, if you were in that situation, you know that this can happen to you too as well, because sometimes when you, you tend to always be at church, you tend to kind of see church differently than maybe everybody else who isn't there all the time. And you have to be careful because you can become a little weird or maybe a little cynical. Andy Stanley says it, it this way. I think it's just perfect. He said, you know, when he was in high school, especially this whole church and going to church and this whole religion thing became like a big game of Jesus says. You know, you ever heard of Simon Says? You know, somebody stands up front, you all stand up. Simon Says, put your hands on your hips. Simon Says, put them down. You know, put your hand on your... Oh, you messed up. You're out of the game. You got to sit. Well, Jesus says, read your Bible. Jesus says, pray. Jesus says, go to... Oh, he didn't say that. You're messed up. You're out. You know, and, and if we're not careful, it can be kind of seen that way. And I understand what he was teaching when he, he says that, because I felt that way myself growing up. But then... I'd get a friend that would invite me to come to a retreat for the weekend, or I'd go to camp, and, and I'd hear the word of God, I'd hear the truth, and oh, I gotta get back into the Jesus Says game. I gotta, Jesus says, read your Bible. Jesus says, go to church. Jesus says, pray. And I'd get back in the game, but what I would find myself doing is I got back in the game and playing the game and got good at the game, I would start looking at you that wasn't playing the game. You know, and wasn't good at the game. And I would start saying, hey, if I'm miserable, you got to be miserable too. <laughs> if I got to play this crazy game, you got to play this crazy game too. And I would find myself becoming very critical of people, very judgmental. Of why aren't they in the game? And, and I actually started to get jealous of those people because, gosh, they seemed to, you know, they could do whatever they want, you know, and, and, and they didn't have to get up at 6 a.m. and go to Mass to make sure because we had this thing to go to at 9. I, we never missed. There was a 6 a.m. Mass, and if we had something going on, that's what we would go to type of thing. And I felt jealous, and I, I thought, man, their life is together when I didn't have it together because I didn't understand church right, and they didn't have it together. And maybe, maybe for as you're sitting there, maybe you understand that. Maybe there's been times in life the church, being a part of the church or being the church hasn't been consistent or times you felt like you wanted to walk away because whatever religious system you grew up in, you know, had those the do's, do's, do's and the don'ts, don'ts, don'ts and you struggled with that. And what I hope to do through this series, I wish I could somehow do this. I wish we could just kind of erase our memory of everything we've ever heard about. God, Jesus, the Bible and religion. And I wish we could almost like pick up a blank slate because I think if we could start from a blank slate and just pick up the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and just read through them the way that they were meant to be read of what they deal with, I think we would be blown away and overwhelmed because it's so extraordinary relational, extraordinarily relational. I mean, it's like relations on steroids that Jesus is saying, this is the kind of relationship that I want to have with you. And he gave, in his time here, he gave three different illustrations of the kind of relationship that he wants to have with us. He said, first of all, one of the relationships I want to have is like a father and a child. He said, I've come on this earth, so one of the reasons I've come is so you can get to know God, God the Father, so you can re be reminded, so you could remember who God is, how much he loves you, so you can call God your dad. I mean, that's pretty intimate, is it not? For us to be able to call God our dad, actually, Abba means daddy. We, when we understand the relationship, we can call God our daddy, and that seems sacrilegious, but that's what God says. That's the kind of one of the relationships. Another one that he uses is vine and a branch that he, he says, I'm going to be the vine and you are the branch. And, and the vine, it doesn't say to the branch, you do this, you do that, you don't do that. The vine gives life to the branch. And as Jesus says, as you learn to abide in me, then things are going to happen. Then you're going to change. Then you're going to grow. 
And the last relationship illustration he gave a lot about was the sheep and the shepherd. You know, that's one that we kind of struggle with because we don't have a lot of shepherds guiding sheep around here uh, for us. But back then, they knew it well. And he says in this relationship, my sheep, they recognize my voice, so they respond. And I'm sure you've heard the illustration before that's given where, like, you can have 10 shepherds that each have 50 sheep, and they bring them to this holding pen, and they'll put them all in there, and they have 500 sheep in there. And in the morning, you know, if I was one of those shepherds, I could get up and I could go to that holding pen and I could make a sound, I could call out, and my 50, and only my 50 sheep would come because they recognize me. Jesus says, that's how much of an intimate relationship I can have, want to have, and do have. When people, when my followers hear my voice, they recognize it, and they move in that direction, you know? And so, this relation, you know, which means if we approach Christianity with anything less or anything more, you know, then perhaps we've missed out on something, that we're simply being invited to this beautiful, extraordinary relationship. And I know you sit there and say, Dave, I hear that all the time. I hear it in lessons. I hear people preach. How do you have a relationship with an invisible God, right? And through this series, we're going to be talking about that. But I, I want to focus on one word through this series that Jesus talked about over and over and over and over again. And that's the word follow the word follow that's there. And we're going to actually take a look at one of the first times it was used. We're going to look at Matthew and that in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew himself is telling the story, and we're going to pick up in Matthew 9.9 where he says this. As Jesus went out from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Now, we've all heard about tax collectors and how much they're loved by the people, right? I mean, I tried to think of an illustration of, of to give us an idea of how much maybe they were hated back then. It's kind of like you know, and being at church, I'm trying to think, what, what can I say at church uh, to illustrate the disgust that they had? But, you know, it's like if, if we discovered a 45-year-old guy at the park selling drugs to little children, getting them high on, you know, on, 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 on meth and all of that, we'd be pretty upset, frustrated, and disgusted with that person, wouldn't we not? Well, that doesn't even come close to how these tax collectors are looked at in the system. If you remember the Roman system, Rome would auction off you know, for the privilege to collect taxes in the providences that they oversaw, like Judea. So Romans, they wanted to get in on this bidding because this is a great business. Because if, if I was a Roman and I was over to, say, like Judea, over that providence and collecting taxes, all I had to do is make sure Rome got their taxes and I could take and get as much as I wanted. It became a very lucrative business. And what, what the Romans would do that would win this auction, they would go, like I, well, since I said Judea, they'd go to Judea and they would hire the local Jewish people there who knew the people and understand the culture. They would hire them to become the tax collectors. And everything was taxed when it came to it. There was poll tax, bridge tax, you know, all kinds of taxes, income tax, food tax, you know, uh, crossroad tax, you know, if you were down at the dock, dock tax, wine tax, property tax, Illinois tax, on and on, you know, and, and that again, we complain, everybody complains about taxes, they had it back there with it too, when it comes to that aspect, and Matthew was one that was chosen, and when you get chosen, then you become a traitor, because these Roman people, they're robbing us, and you're you're helping them rob us and take from us what they don't deserve, and so you are a traitor, you are scum, you are, and here's Matthew. And Jesus, who's this rabbi, this teacher that's highly respected, that has this crowd follow him, he comes up, and there's Matthew sitting at this tax collector booth. He could have said anything. I mean, he could have walked up and said, hey, Matthew, I bet your mom's really proud of you, you know? I mean, he could have said anything, and anything he could have said or maybe should have said, or might, we might even felt he would have been justified to say, so much he could have said, he says to Matthew, these words that I think blew Matthew away, follow me, follow me. And I would imagine, you know, the scripture doesn't tell us, you know, what it was like at that time. But this is how my brain works when I read, you know, the scripture and go through it. I can almost hear an audible sound of moaning and groaning going through the crowd. Can you not? You know, these Jews that hate, it's like, what? No way. Not him. Not that guy. Not that scum. I mean, you can almost hear like Peter. No way. I'm not going to, I can't. If that means that you call him. He's with me, and I'm not with him. And Jesus says, Matthew, follow me. And in Matthew 9, 9, the rest of it, it says, As Jesus went out from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. And if you're one of clo Jesus' closest followers, you're like, wait. I'm sorry, it can't be that simple. That you could walk up to this lowly person, this person that society looks at, hates at, 
and just simply say, follow me, it can't be that simple. Because again, remember, Jesus is this rabbi. He's this teacher. And so when he gives an invitation like that, it's not like an invitation where you pull out your phone and say, hey, let's be Facebook buds, <laughs> you know? And maybe, you know, I'll like a picture you have. I might even put a grin smiley face on something you do. And that, no, this was, you come and you become a part of my posse. You connect with me and I connect with you. You follow and, and, and that. This is an extremely important thing that was happening. We begin to identify. I identify with you, you identify with me. And here's what I want you to understand what Jesus didn't say. For those of us like we see myself, like I said, that grew up in the Jesus says, this is what we would have expected him. We would have expected him to have gone up and said, hey, okay, Matthew, if you will, and then fill in the blank from whatever you're using. If you will do these things, you know, if you won't. Here's, here's this list. I want you to study it and this check. And, and if I see, for the, I'll come back in three to four weeks and, and you've checked them all off for the next two, hey, you're in. He didn't say any of those kinds of things, you know. He just said, Matthew, follow me, follow me. And here's what's significant about this, and, and we're going to talk about it for the next several weeks. That same invitation that Jesus extended throughout the gospel, he extended it to all kinds of people. In fact, the question that I hope and I pray that we'll grapple with, that we'll struggle with, that'll be in our forefront, if we could just kind of simply get everything out of the other way and not ask ourselves questions like, well, well how much do I know? You know, am I a Christian and, and stuff like that? You know, did I go to church? Did I read? Did I do? Did I don't? If we could just break it down to simply say, am I following? If that can be the question over this series that we can, you know, ask yourself and ask ourselves and pray for each other as we try to answer, am I following? And you say, but wait, that's just way too simple. If that's where you're at, I understand and, and don't feel bad because it was too, way too simple for the religious people in Jesus' day as well. In fact, the story continues. Matthew gives us really interesting detail in Matthew 9.10. He says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, it's like, okay, now wait a minute. It's one thing that you call the guy to walk with us, and i got to be seen walking down the road. You can, again, you can almost hear Peter. I don't want to be walking down the road with him, but I'm getting to the point that this guy's going to walk. He can walk up there, or I can walk back, whatever. He's going to be walking. I've gotten over that, but I ain't going. I might get like tax collector cooties or something. I am not going to his house. It's just not right. It is wrong, you know. But Jesus is like, Matthew, let me tell you where we're going. We're going to your house. And this is how Jesus rolls all the time. Remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, was a wee little man, was he? You know that cute little song we teach? And he climbed up the tree, and Jesus saw him and said, Hey, Zacchaeus, come on down here. And where did he go? He went to Zacchaeus' house. He said, We're going to go someplace that's familiar to you, Zacchaeus. We're going to go someplace that's comfortable to you. It might hurt my reputation, but it's going to give us an opportunity to begin to relate. And in Matthew 9, 10, Matthew continues with the story. He says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners. Hmm. I like that. They can't even be lumped together. Tax collectors have to be separated with sinners. They're so low. It's like I could stand there and say, well, I might be a sinner, but I ain't as bad as that tax collector right there. You know, yeah, that's the bottom of the barrel right there, that guy, you know, when it came to that aspect on it. And, and so Matthew, all he has is what? You can only associate with like-minded people like it. I mean, other tax collectors. Tax collectors, they didn't even go to the temple and, and, and do the sacrifices for their sin because they know the people didn't want them at the temple, wouldn't accept it, and a lot of the times they weren't even allowed. So their philosophy was, let's eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we might die and we might go to hell, so let's have a party and let's have fun. And so Jesus goes to Matthew's house. Matthew invites all these tax collectors, you know, and, and there's other people getting around and and, and, and they're following, and, and they might be sitting there wondering what's going on. You know, who's this guy that's with you? Haven't met him. Why are all these Pharisees looking in on us and stuff like that? But this becomes an extremely big deal. And this is something I think the church struggles with today. This is something that I think is being the church, I think we get tripped up on so much today, ten fingers pointed here, that we find ourselves falling over ourselves when it comes to this. This is so important for us to understand. If we're called to follow, who are we called to follow? Jesus. So if we're called to follow Jesus, as we're following Jesus, we're trying to be like who? Jesus, okay? And, and, and in this scenario, in this situation, that we see Jesus at Matthew's house and stuff like that, this is what we have to understand. Jesus was extremely comfortable with people who weren't anything like him. And as you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, apparently people who were nothing like Jesus were extremely comfortable with him as, as well. You know? I mean, that's something we have to grapple with. 
do I hang with? Do I like being around people that I'm not comfortable with? You know, or, or that aren't comfortable, or, or that aren't anything like me? Can I be comfortable with that? Have you ever been around somebody that's so comfortable with themselves that they make everybody else, you know, comfortable in the room? I mean, that's Jesus, you know? Even though he's God, like I've heard it said, he's, you know, he's God in a bod, as they say today, you know, even though he's God incarnate, he's in an environment surrounded by people who would tell you if they could stand here that they felt no judgment. They were tax collectors. They, they were sinners. People who were nothing like Jesus in that, in their lives. But when it comes to that aspect. And see, the, the thing that we struggle with, like I said with the church, is what we have to understand that when people come to church, when people come in and we are the church, when people come to the church building to come together corporately to worship, when people walk in and they don't feel loved by the church people, this church or any church, if they don't feel loved by the church, if they don't feel welcome, if they don't feel accepted, you know, if they feel kind of a sense of ah uh, and a looking down on, that's the church's fault. That's our fault. Those that call ourselves followers and believers in Christ, that's not our Savior's fault because our Savior was completely comfortable with people who were nothing like him. And they liked him. And like I said, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I hope you do. <laughs> people like this followed him everywhere. And here's the kicker. Jesus loved them and liked them. And Jesus would love and like you as well. That's what I don't think we understand. You know, He's not going to be put off by the things that we have done wrong, by our sin. Jesus would not be uncomfortable even though he knew our thoughts, even though he knew our actions. You know, he goes up to Matthew sitting there. He knew exactly what Matthew had done a year ago on that exact day. You know, six months ago. He knew what Matthew did the night before. He knew the thoughts in Matthew's minds of what he wanted to do the night before. And all he simply said was, follow me. Even though he knew all of that. Matthew 9, 11. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? I mean, they're confused. He's a rabbi. He's a holy man. We're holy men. He studies the Word of God. We study the Word of God. He worships God. We worship. He is like us, but yet he doesn't want to be with us. What's, what's going on? And they were confused. And Jesus, he knew that there was disturbance. As he sat around, how, whatever it looked like there in Matthew's house, you know, and all these people that were with Matthew trying to figure out who's who and what's what, Jesus heard these questions. He knew the hearts, and he responded in Matthew 9, 12. On hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Now imagine this, if you're Matthew, okay? And you hear that. You and Jesus, are he's in with you in, in your house. What's going through your head? Uh, healthy, sick? You're in here? I mean, you're my guest, I understand. But you're in here with us, sitting with us. You're not out there with them. You're not out there with them because they're healthy? And so you being in here hanging with us means we're sick? That's kind of rude, Jesus. <laughs> You know, that's kind of rude. You're calling me and my friend sick. And I don't know how it went down, but I can see Jesus smiling at Matthew and saying, dude, you're a tax collector. You're sick. You know, you are sick. And look at all your friends, you know, that are tax collectors with you. And they're kind of like, yeah, high five. And yeah, we're sick, you know, and, and that. And, and you need me. You need me. And so Jesus kind of brings this offense into the house to Matthew. But he doesn't stop there with the offense. His offense goes on uh, in Matthew 9, 13. But go... But go and learn what this means. Now, this offense is strictly to the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees, like I said, these are the people trying to be good. These are the people that are studying the law. They know it left to right, up and down, in and out. But they don't know it. They have it up here, but not down here. And Jesus offends them because he says, You know that law that you study and you know so well, you got it wrong. And he quotes the prophet Hosea. He says, you need to go back and you need to relearn this. And then he continues in Matthew 9, 13. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. In other words, he says, I'm not content to simply be with people who believe all the right things. And I'm not simply content to hang out with people who behave all the right ways. What he's saying is, I want to join with people who believe the right things and behave the right ways in order to call people who don't believe all the right things and don't behave all the right ways, who knows that there's something more that they need in their life. See, for those of us, for those of us who do say we're followers, we're Christians, this is why this is so important, because we don't want to become a church 
to content to gather together and believe the right things and behave the right ways and then just to stay there, you know? Because if we do, we'll find ourselves standing outside the very room that Jesus inhabits as he comes to call the sick and sinners who need a Savior. See, I don't want to pastor a church, and I honestly believe, you know, in your hearts, you don't want to be a part of church. It's all about believe the right way and behave the right way and forget that we have been called to partner with our Savior for those who have this sneaky suspicion that they need something more and that there is something greater and better that's out there. We've learned, you know, we've learned this year that there is more to life, that we have been called. We have been called and been privileged to have been given the opportunity to partner with our Savior for those who would claim to be and acknowledge that I think I'm outside of the faith. But you know what? It's not enough to believe right. It's not enough to behave right. In fact, the church or the small group or the group of Christians that's content to simply believe right and behave right, what happens is they eventually become the Pharisees. You know? They'll eventually become, well, they play, start playing the Jesus game. They become judgmental, finger pointers, however you want to put it. And then they'll say, as soon as you change, you can become a part of us. And Jesus said, that's so messed up. That's not what it's about. This is why I came. You know? Jesus showed up and he says, no, you come follow me and then you'll change. Matthew, I'm not asking you. Just start following me. We're going to go to your house. Pharisees, wait a minute. You can't do that. No, that's your game plan. Your game book is this. You do the right stuff. You take a little test and if you pass, you're in. That's not mine. And that's what this series, I hope, is going to be about. It's about saying regardless of where you are and whatever end of the spectrum, that invitation that Matthew heard is the same invitation that's out there for us and everybody else. And, and, and I just want to uh, help us move in the right direction. I want to wrap this up and kind of move us in the right direction. There, there's four very quick things about follow that I want you to be thinking about. First of all, being a sinner does not disqualify you. Being a follower, okay? It's actually a prerequisite. Everybody that Jesus called to follow was a sinner. The, o- the only people that, that resisted following Jesus were people who thought that they were perfect. Okay? I mean, Matthew. Matthew hadn't done anything great, hadn't been anything great. Matthew hadn't made a public profession of faith. Matthew hadn't entered the waters of baptism. Matthew hadn't done anything like that. Matthew was a tax collector, hated by the people and everything. And he just says, Matthew, if you would just start to follow me, start taking baby steps, you know, they're, you're going to see you're going to see there's no sin, there's no habit, there's no addiction, there's no illness, there's no problem that puts you outside of the circle of those that have been invited in, who've been invited to follow Jesus. You might say, ha, but Dave, you don't know me. I don't have to. Jesus doesn't. I believe if he was standing right here today, he would look you square in the eyes and give each and every one of you the exact same invitation. And the second, the second thing to realize about follow is being an unbeliever doesn't disqualify you. Being an unbeliever does not disqualify you to be a follower. Most of the people that followed Jesus at the beginning were unbelievers, as a matter of fact. You know, And like I said, as you keep hearing me encouraging you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's funny. Two years into their ministry, two years into them following him, Jesus does something and it says, and they believe. In my mind, as I'm reading, I'm thinking, what did they do for the first two years? Not, not believe? But how many times do you read through that and you hear Jesus in his teaching saying, your unbelief, your unbelief, you know? He would talk to them about their unbelief, and they're saying, we're trying to believe. In fact, one of his closest followers has a nickname today. Remember, Doubting Who? Yeah, Doubting Thomas. When it came to the crucifixion and the resurrection, you know, he didn't see him at first, and so he doubted. Maybe it's a trick. And you know what Jesus didn't do when he saw Thomas? He didn't come into Thomas and say, really, Thomas, you've been with me how long? And you still don't understand? You still don't believe? You're not playing Jesus says you're out of the game. He didn't say that to him. See, here's what I want you to hear me say. It doesn't matter how little faith you have, even if you have no faith. Everybody is invited to become a follower of Jesus, which means you don't have to believe in him. He's divine. You don't even have to believe his historical. Just pick up the Bible and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And listen to the love letters. And when you do, you're going to understand this third point about follow I want us to understand. The invitation to follow is purely an invitation to a relationship, and it's huge. It's not an invitation to the Ten Commandments. It's not even an invitation to obedience. We get this wrong, okay? See, those of you that are married, been married, going to be married, you know, if you're married, okay, and the person you're married to obeyed all the marriage rules and you obeyed all the marriage rules, would you have a good relationship? It's a trick question. (laughs) 
I'm going to say no if that's how you went about it, okay? I believe there are do's and don'ts in a relationship, in a marriage relationship. But I don't do the things I do in my marriage and don't do the things I don't do because there's do's and don'ts and rules to follow. I do them because I love Melinda with all my heart. All right? And I don't get up in the morning and say, all right, open, you know, my, my, my Evernote app and say, okay, here's my list of ten. Oh, oh boy, she added five more do's. <laughs> you know, and okay, and here's the don'ts and then check them off. Okay, I've done my do's, I've done my don'ts. I followed the rules I'm married not how I do it. I follow it and I do that because I love it. And Jesus says, if you start following me, if you start understanding, you're going to start saying things different. You're going to start being different. You're going to start looking at people different. Why? Because it's not because you open an app and you say, oh, here's, here's what Christianity do's and don'ts are and you check them off. It's because you fall in love with Jesus and you want to do those things he asks you to do. And you don't want to do these things that go against him. It's because you love Jesus. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you're going to discover, discover you're being invited into a relationship that begins with you just as you are. And the fourth thing is, following forces me to focus on where I am rather than where you're not. That's why it's so important to follow. You know? Because if you're a Christian and you don't follow, you're not actively following, you become, and you can become like a Pharisee. Because, see, when I wake up every day, and I say, God, my goal isn't to keep 10 things. My goal today is to be the best of my ability just to simply follow you. That I become so aware of my responsibility that I don't have time to judge you. <laughs> and, and, you know, the thing is, if you have ever felt judged by a church in any way, shape, or form, that's probably because you have some very well-meaning people that have come in and, and, and they've fallen into the Jesus Says game. They believe everything right. They believe, you know, behave everything right. But somewhere along the way, they quit following and they just started evaluating. They just started judging. Another way I've heard it said is this. The more conscious I am of the work God has yet to do in me, the less critical I am of what God has yet to do in you. See, this is what makes the body of Christ so beautiful. This is what makes the church, when the church is hitting on all cylinders, absolutely fantastic because you have men and women coming together. Some know a little, some know a lot. Some have been walking with God for a long time, some have just started. Some have this incredible faith, some don't. But to the best of their ability, they're all moving in the same direction to learn to become more and better followers of Jesus. And I'm telling you, there is something beautiful and powerful about that. So we're launching this series, and as we launch, I hope it becomes a conversation around the table. That's why you're going to see in your sermon notes. They're not sermon notes. I've actually given you questions that you can take, and maybe yourself ask, or get with a friend, or get with a family member, and discuss these questions, you know? And, and, and not, am I doing this? Am I not doing this? Am I doing... Just bring it down to that simplicity. As I look through this, am I following? Am I in the process? Am I engaged in the process of following Jesus? And this invitation is, is extended to every single person on the planet because sin does not disqualify you. A lack of belief doesn't disqualify you because it's an invitation to a relationship. And for some of you, that relationship can begin with just getting plugged in to a church. See, that's why one of the best things you could do, that's why we're making some changes that we've had here. That's why our focus is changing here because we believe it's powerfully biblical and powerfully true that we've seen. Is And you hear me teach and preach on it all the time, is to get plugged in to small groups because your relationship with Jesus may actually begin with a relationship with some of his followers. It's, it's why being involved in a great church is important because being involved in a relationship with his followers is the first step for many people to being in an active relationship with him because when we come together under the banner uh, of what Christ has called us to do, you know, when we come together under the banner of who Christ has called us to be, then we are the presence of Christ on this planet. And what happens in that intimacy in those small groups is not what happens. I mean, what we're doing now is great, coming together corporately to worship. You know, but biblical fellowship is not happening right now. You know, and that intimacy, I know in my small group that I meet with, I know there's things that we can talk about. We've had people talk about and share things. I know there's things that I can say, hey, I want you to hold me accountable. And there's people that have said that in my small group. I, I give you permission to do this. When we study different topics and get intimate, I don't give all of you that permission, <laughs> you know, because I don't want all the calls. But, you know, I do my small group that's meeting with me because of the relationship, because of the intimacy. And we, in a sense, that helps us become who Christ wants us to be. That helps us follow the way Christ wants us to follow. 
So as we get ready at this time, uh, and the worship team is going to come out and continue to allow us to worship this God that just simply says, look at here's my son. Follow. As we get ready to take some time and, and, and remember what the elements stand for and what we're singing, I just want to encourage you during this time as you, as you sit and we celebrate and we reflect and we remember, you know, Christ giving his body and his blood that was shed for us, and when we remember him raising from the grave and, and what that means for us, I, I encourage you to also just spend some time and let God's Spirit speak to your heart and, and take a look and start evaluating now. How, how is the following going? Are you following? If not, why not starting today? And whenever you're ready, you can go to any one of the tables. If you're un- unable to make it, just raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring you communion. And that, and after you take communion, you're welcome to stay seated while you sing, or if you want to stand up and sing, it's up to you. But also during that time, if there's something that you need prayer for, if there's a decision you want to make, if you want to say, you know, I want to start following today, I just don't know how, and you want to start that conversation, I'll be up front, you can come on up for prayer, and that you can come on up and start, or well, you got our contact information in the bulletin, get a hold of us, get a hold of us, so we can do life together. But let's go before God right now. Father, I thank you for this time that we could be in your presence and be reminded, Father. Be reminded of that relationship you desire for us. I pray, Father God, as we just take this time and remember and reflect and celebrate the gift of your Son. I pray, Heavenly Father, as we look at his life, we remember that simple but beautiful and powerful calling that he gives to all of us. Just follow him. I pray that your Spirit will look at our hearts, will search our hearts, and help us to see, do we understand that? Are we playing the Jesus Says game? Help us to see where we are in that walk or, 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 or where we are in that, Father God, and, 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 and give us the wisdom and strength that we need to start following maybe in ways we haven't before. Thank you for this time that we could come together and celebrate and give thanks and, and, and be reminded of all of this, Father. We just pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.